Hi everyone, it's Kelly with the Women for One and your Messy Brilliant Show. I am over the top excited to be speaking with Miriam Williamson, who is one of my heroes, sheroes, and she's an author, a speaker, an activist, and has really served humanity in her lifetime to this great extent where people are uplifted and really imbued with knowledge and her wisdom. Miriam Williamson is an internationally acclaimed spiritual author and lecturer. She has been a popular guest on television programs such as Oprah, Larry King Live, Good Morning America, Charlie Rose, and Bill Maher. Seven of her 12 published books have been New York Times bestsellers. Four of these has been number one. The mega bestseller, and one of my favorites, A Return to Love, is considered a must-read of the new spirituality. A paragraph from that book beginning, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure, is considered an anthem for a contemporary generation of seekers. Marianne's other books include The Law of Divine Compensation, The Age of Miracles, Everyday Grace, A Woman's Worth, Illuminata, Healing the Soul of America, A Course in Weight Loss, The Gift of Change, Enchanted Love, A Year of Miracles, and her newest book that we'll be speaking about today, Tears to Triumph, The Spiritual Journey from Suffering to Enlightenment. Marianne is a native of Houston, Texas, and in 1989, she founded Project Angel Food, a Meals on Wheels program that serves homebound people with AIDS in the Los Angeles area. To date, Project Angel Food has served over 8 million meals. She also serves on the advisory board of the Results Organization, working to end the worst ravages of hunger and poverty throughout the world. Marianne also co-founded the Peace Alliance. Now, according to Time Magazine, yoga, the Kabbalah, and Miriam Williamson have been taken up by those seeking a relationship with God that is not strictly tethered to Christianity. So I am so honored to be speaking with Marianne today, discussing her book, Tears to Triumph, so that we can all address the issues affecting us in our society and really move into a space of love. So welcome, Marianne Williamson, and I'm so honored to have you here. And thank you for all of your work and service to women and the whole, all of humanity in the world. You're really one of my sheroes, for sure. Well, thank you very much. I'm honored to be here, and I <clears throat> commend you on the great work you're doing, too, Kelly. Thank you, Marianne. Um, I would love to start because, you know, you're a best-selling author, you're a speaker, you're an activist, you've, you've done so much in your life. And I wanted to ask you before we move into the book we're going to talk about today, a little bit about where you are in your journey right now and what your focus is um, with your service to the world. Well, I turned 65 years old this summer. And I, like anybody in my generation, is aware, am aware that this is act three now. And you have to become very conscious and intentional about Act Three, uh, because if you are not, you begin this sort of just slow cruise towards an end that may take a long time or a short time, but that represents more of a devolution than an evolution. If you are conscious and intentional, and I think so many of us want to be, and I've written about this and talked about this, then you really see this as the time when there is no time to waste, uh, no more five-year detours, and whatever it is that you feel you have learned, <clears throat> in my case, what I feel I've learned, anything I've done, the question now is how can I bring it all together in order to be of the greatest service, um, the greatest bang-up job in the time I have left. So that's what I think is on anybody's mind at a certain point. There is an urgent, yeah, there is an urgent time now, definitely. It feels ur well, that, urgency. That, exactly, because my being this age uh, intersects with what you just said, the urgency of the times in which we live, which of course is impacting all of us no matter how old we are. But I do feel that my act three has something to do with a response to uh, some of the larger external conditions that I feel were caused by 
those of us in spirituality and <clears throat> higher consciousness know that these external places of stress, anxiety, craziness, and chaos were caused by internal factors. And I feel that a conversation bringing the two together in which I might help articulate, number one, how many of these external points of crisis were manufactured by internal uh, <clears throat> mistakes and how we might dismantle the mindset that created the mistakes and transform the mindset and thus transform the condition. So that's what I will try the best, my best to do for the rest of my life. That's amazing. Yes. So your book, Tears to Triumph, which is out in paperback now, I actually have the hardcover and the soft cover of this, is really a book about where we are in avoiding pain right now and how to heal that and how it's harmed us to avoid diving into our pain, even allowing for it and learning from it. So can you talk a little bit about that um, and the summary of the book before we go into some questions around it? If it were hundreds of years ago, people looked to their churches, to their synagogues, to other religious institutions to find comfort during their time of sorrow and to find inspiration. And for many reasons, that has having to do in some cases with the organized religious institutions themselves, with the whole advent of the scientific revolution, industrial revolution, and so forth, for many reasons, people no longer necessarily look to religious institutions to find comfort and to find inspiration. That baton was passed in many ways to psychology, mm -hmm. but uh, with the advent of Freudian psychology and so forth. What has happened over the last hundred years while that psychotherapeutic uh, paradigm has been so dominant, is that there has been a failure uh, on the part of the psychotherapeutic industry <clears throat> profession because of its over-secularization, because pain and sorrow uh, uh, having to do deeply rooted in the human condition, it, this is a spiritual issue. This has to do with a life lived outside the cosmically ordered universe. A cosmically ordered universe is a universe that stems from our capacity to love each other. And when our love of each other is not the, the organizing principle of a tribe, of a community, of a family, of a society, then we are cast psychically, both by things that happen externally and also by, by the internal dynamics then at play, into a, a, a psychic universe of chaos and suffering and depression. This is a spiritual issue. So what has happened, because the dominant over-secularized <clears throat> psychotherapeutic model so utterly failed to really provide the level of comfort that we want. I mean, I might talk to you all day and know that my stuff came from mommy and daddy and at a certain point, yeah, and. <laughs> so what's happened over the last few decades is in a very quick way, in a startling way, if you stand back and look at it, is the baton has been passed once more. And that is the psychopharmacology. And now the prescription of antidepressants um, is so huge. When you're talking about psychotherapeutic drugs and bipolar disease, schizophrenia, obvious mental illness, that's not my bailiwick. That's not, you know, that's not my profession. That's not my expertise. I'm the first to say that. <clears throat> but what I'm talking about is the overprescription of antidepressants in situations that are within the spectrum of normal human despair, heartbreak, divorce, financial loss, bankruptcy, professional failure, the loss of a loved one. These things are painful, Kelly, but they're not mm -hmm. mental illnesses. And the medicalization of despair, even this, like where people just come up with this stuff, like, oh, there's depression, but then there's clinical depression. Kelly, clinical depression just means somebody said it in a clinic. And if you get yeah. online and you read what the symptoms are of depression, clinical depression, I defy anybody to say, never been there, never been there, never been there. This is particularly important to me, Kelly, because of the fact that we are living in such extraordinarily um, chaotic times. This is not a time for any of us to be buffered from our real feelings. This is not a time for any of us to think that something's okay when in fact it's not okay. The fact that so many of us are depressed is for a reason. Something is wrong. If you break your leg, <clears throat> the brain, you know, the universe, the nature is brilliant. You register pain in your leg because you need to know this 
bone needs to be reset. You can't just take morphine. You need to reset the bone. Psychic pain is there for a reason as well. It is part of the immune system. You're, you're in pain psychically because something is wrong. You're off. Something is off. These profound signals of nature. You can't just buffer yourself from the pain. You have to, you have to reset your thinking. We have to reset our thinking in this civilization. We have to reset our behavior. And I particularly feel strongly about it in terms of American women, Kelly. We should be so kick-ass. We should be yes. warriors justice. We should be Amazonian. We should be handling this stuff. The last thing we need is to be thinking it's okay when in fact it's not. And also what I go into the, in the book is <clears throat> the fact that the dominant psychotherapeutic paradigm over the last hundred years, which has been so focused on, okay, Kelly, tell me why you're depressed. I put us into this separate silo where Kelly thinks she's depressed because of what's happening in her life, and Marilyn thinks she's unhappy because of what's happening in her life, and Gloria thinks she's unhappy because of what's happening in her life, and none of us are standing back and going, oh, we're unhappy because of what is happening in life. We're unhappy because of what is happening in all of our lives. Because the same thing that's threatening your children is threatening my children. The same thing that's causing this unbelievable economic stress in your life is causing economic stress in my life. The same stuff that's going down between you and your man is going down with me and my man because it's going down between men and women. So there is so much that, um, that calls us now to reset our thinking, which is what a miracle is, that shift in perception. And this is not a time mm. to be to be in any way buffering ourselves. You know, sometimes when it comes to <clears throat> antidepressants, people will say, oh, well, just take the edge off while you're doing the work. But you know, Kelly, in some ways, being with the edge is the work. Being with the edge is the work. Well, how do we do this, Marianne? Because a lot of people in my community, I mean, women for one, we encourage women to share their stories, not to recycle in them, but to be able to get a different percep perception, to get a perspective here now. So how do, I mean, a lot of women write me and ask me like, what do I do with this story? You've got this great life. And I know that that's the way it looks, but in perception, we're all suffering together because we're all connected. Correct. There are two main categories here. One has to do with owning our own mistakes and the second one, forgiving other people for theirs. A lot of the anxiety and the depression that we feel in life is remorse. And only a sociopath feels no remorse. So sometimes the pain and the anxiety that we feel is because we feel that we've made mistakes. And what the religious and spiritual traditions give you is tools for atonement, tools for owning our mistakes, tools for, as they say in AA, uh, really listing your character defects and owning them. Uh, the atonement in Catholicism is you do confession as you go along. Uh, in, in Judaism, Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, is the most powerful day of the year, holiest day of the year. This I, is, a, once again, a spiritual, a religious tool by which we look at all of the things we're carrying in terms of shame, in terms of humiliation, in terms of embarrassment, in terms of guilt, and it gives us ways that I talk about in the book to actually own our errors so that we don't go forward loaded down by the shame and embarrassment about the past and really experience God's grace in lifting us up so that we can be better people now. Now, the second category is forgiving other people for their mistakes. And we need to develop mercy for us when we ourselves know we've made mistakes and mercy for others when they have. A lot of our pain and depression is because we perceive ourselves as victims. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't see yourself as a victim and be happy. So you have to decide, <clears throat> am I going to play the victim card or am I going to reach for happiness? Your victory is your capacity to forgive. So once again, look at the words I've used here. Uh, mercy, forgiveness, atonement. Mm -hmm. Usually when we talk about depression in America today, we don't go into words like mercy, forgiveness, and atonement. That's why I wanted to write this book. What is the spiritual context for human suffering? What is the spiritual context and what are the spiritual tools? All of the great religious systems. Uh, in Buddhism, <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, Buddha did not begin his journey to enlightenment until he crossed over the, the walls around his father's compound and saw suffering and sickness and death for the first time. In Judaism, in the Old Testament, God sent Moses to, to rescue the Israelites when they were suffering as slaves in Egypt. And, of course, Jesus suffered on the cross. You know, there's a lot of new, new thought spirituality that kind of 
just glosses over the crucifixion, jumps right to the resurrection. That's, that's, that's not transcendence. That's just denial. And in our society, we've taken this cheap yellow smiley face and just put it over everything. Be happy, be happy, be happy. But sometimes, Kelly, the happiest, most meaningful life does have sad days until we are an enlightened master. And there That's are real. It's real. It's yeah. just realness. Yeah. It's real. It's also, it's like if you have a cut on your hand mm -hmm. and, or anywhere on your body and it gets really red, that's because the red blood cells are rushing to the scene. It, that's not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing that got really red. It means the red blood cells are on it. Sometimes when you have a fever, that's a good thing. You're burn, your body's burning stuff up. So sometimes the sad moments, that's why spiritually they're called the dark night of the soul. It, right. it, it should be seen as a sacred <clears throat> period to, to hold within a sacred context, as I talk about in the book, right. so that it can be not only endured, but also transformed. Yes. And you talk about the dark night of the soul in the book on page four, which I was going to bring up earlier. And it's just so beautiful. You, you said, as someone who has always viewed things through a mystical lens, even before I understood what that meant, I've always seen events in my life in the context of a spiritual journey. And you, and you go on to talk about it and said, I knew that somehow, in some way, my suffering would lead to a blazing, blazing new dawn in my life, but only if I was willing to endure the deep, dark night preceding it. And it just resonated with me so much because I've learned so much from pain in my life. Can we talk a little bit about empathy? Because you talk about it in the book with Roosevelt and some other things. The empathy of understanding others, you think, is really helpful as well in moving forward and understanding each other. It's not just helpful. It's everything. <laughs> it's everything. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's another thing, Kelly, about why that we should not be buffering ourselves from our pain. If I buffer myself from my pain, I am going to be buffering myself from your pain. I know, you know, suffering gives us x-ray vision into other people's lives. Yeah, the x-ray you know, vision. You know, right. one of the things that I think about a lot is, is the invasion of Iraq, which now is <clears throat> universally thought of as having been a huge mistake. Where were we, Kelly? Where were American women? What were we thinking? What, what were we thinking about the fact that women in Iraq, mothers in Iraq, mo uh, sisters and, and, and wives in Iraq and lovers, in, just like us, were going to have rain falling down from the sky on them. They would not be able to protect their children. And this country mm -hmm. had done nothing to us. It had nothing to do with 9-11. Right. And even if they had weapons of mass destruction, we do business every day with countries that have weapons of mass destruction. So where were we? We were desensitized. There was a lack of empathy. We weren't thinking about, oh, my God, <clears throat> why would we do this to these people? Not in my name, not with my tax dollars. And we, 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 we're not feeling the pain of others in large part, I think, because we're trying to buffer ourselves from our own pain. Once you open yourself to your own pain, which feels dangerous. It does. I own that. I get afraid when I see something on TV. I'm like, sometimes it's too hard. It's the opposite. Right. What, if you see your pain within a spiritual context, you're held in the arms of God while you go through this right. healing process. And you have a psychic immune system, just like you have a physical immune system. Mm -hmm. What is dangerous is everybody buffering ourselves mm -hmm. from our pain because then we're not learning the lessons Mm -hmm. And okay. I can feel like when I speak to you, when I hear you speak and the lectures you give and when I see you on interviews and I read your words, you are embodying that love. You can feel it. If you're, if you're diving into the love, you can feel the love more. Don't you feel like with other people when you're with them? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that what we experience in our pain is that humanity is fragile. Mm -hmm. And I... I when I think of, okay, Marianne, what has helped you in your life? I was thinking about this one day and I realized the greatest help I've ever received in my life has been anyone who was ever kind to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we don't hold each other gently too often. And of course, one of the things that I don't talk about that much in this book, but that I think is a big issue is some of our greatest unkindness at a deep level is towards the people we love the most. Mm -hmm. I see when I, when I counsel couples and in my own life, um, sometimes in my pain, uh, 
you know, the Course in Miracles says anything that is not love is a call for love. You just, we're, we're harsh with each other sometimes. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's this place for me personally, it's terror. It's like the terror of intimacy and that's not diving into love, right? That's not, I, I, I can feel when you're saying that cause I, I thought of my husband sometimes I'm, I'm so afraid of the love he gives me. I'm more afraid of the love than the anger and well, the distance. So it's just yeah. good to own that, to really look at it and get aware about it. Yeah. But the Course in Miracles says you create what you defend against. Mm -hmm. So when we go like this because Mm -hmm. we don't want to hurt, what we're doing is setting up subconsciously a situation where it is inevitable that we will be. Right, right. So it also, you brought up um, spirituality, and I wanted to ask you about that because, you know, I've been a seeker my whole life, and I'm curious what you feel like um, grounded spirituality is, especially with what what you're talking about in this book and diving into the pain, because there is a lot of, uh, uh, there are a lot of teachers out there that really it's interpreted that they teach to avoid the pain and that this isn't our reality and we need to bypass it. And I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. I always wanted to ask you that. (laughs) The Course in Miracles does not teach us to ignore the illusion. And ultimately, this three-dimensional reality is an illusion. And Einstein said it. It's an mm-hmm. illusion, albeit a persistent one. But the message for a serious spiritual seeker is not, therefore, ignore it. There is no serious spiritual or religious path that gives any of us a pass on addressing the suffering of other sentient beings. Mm-hmm. A Course mm-hmm. in Miracles says <clears throat> we're not here to ignore the illusion but to transform it, that the Spirit of God sends us into the illusion. Our bodies are ultimately an illusion. Your house and my apartment, it's all an illusion. But that doesn't mean it doesn't matter. Our job is to dwell within the illusion mm-hmm. at the highest okay. level of thinking of which the ego uh, can, can dwell. That means with compassion, with uh, charity, with forgiveness, with love. Uh, what you and I are both doing here. You're using your talents and your abilities uh, trying to help others. I'm using my talents and abilities trying to help others. We meet in a matrix of collaboration in order that we both might do even more. This is still within the illusion, but it's taking the illusion to the highest place, which is love, rather than keeping it in those lower thought forms of fear and separation. Now, as a Course in Miracles student, I'm taught that there is literally a voice for God inside all of us. And as we meditate and as we pray, we become intuitionally guided by an internal teacher or guidance system, just as every cell in the body is led by a natural intelligence Mm -hmm. to collaborate with other cells in order to serve the healthy functioning of the organ and the organism of which they are part. And when a cell in the body disconnects from that natural intelligence and goes off to do its own thing, that's what cancer is. That's what a malignancy is. So what's happened on the planet is we have been we have been infected by a malignant consciousness. And that consciousness in human culture is no different than in the body. It's when one cell divides off and says, I don't want to help. I don't want to be part of the collaborative matrix that's serving the whole. I want to go off and do my own thing. Now, that's when the cell in the body has lost its natural intelligence. And when we are not guided by love, love is our natural intelligence. Mm -hmm. So through prayer, through meditation, through spiritual practice, we too are at the behest of this natural guidance system of love. And this heals not only our bodies, but it heals our civilization. Mm, That's beautiful. Um, So what are some spiritual principles that really deliver us to, to move into and uh, allow for the pain, but also to move into it and heal ourselves more that you talk about in the book. I mean, I read it, but I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> One of the things I talk about in the book, I've had two periods of, of I mean, we all have sad days, and, you know, oh, I'm depressed today or whatever, but I've had two periods in my life that would be definitely deemed uh, clinical depression. And the last time it happened, I remember seeing that it was like a black wave that I just saw coming at me. And I knew that it could not be avoided. I knew it was coming. I knew the situation that had caused it. And because of my spiritual seeking and and education and understanding and discipline, which is really why I wrote this book, I I wanted to share these principles because without them, I don't know where I would have been. But with them, I knew, okay, I have to surrender into this. I can't avoid it. It's coming. 
And that was the first thing. Sometimes when you're in, when you're depressed, you have to make room for the depression. It's not going to be over tomorrow necessarily, <clears throat> or next week, or even after that. So get a lot of bubble bath, get a lot of, um, you know, start downloading a lot of uh, uh, videos. Know that there are going to be, there's going to be a lot of crying here. There's going to be a, a lot of um, uh, maybe some sleepless nights. And that's okay because you're going to surrender this to God. And the pain and the tears are going to be because you're going to have to look at some things, including your part in bringing about this disaster. What did I do to contribute to the fact that I lost my job? What did I do to contribute to the fact that my marriage isn't working? What did I do? You know, it's painful. Yes. It's painful to take an honest look at ourselves, and that's okay. Also, principles like having only people around you who really understand and are willing to be awake with you in the garden of your, the night of your agony, and not like, you know, when I was growing up, Kelly, it was understood, for instance, if somebody had, had lost someone that they loved, a parent, a child, a husband, a wife, that they were going to be in mourning for a while. And society gave more permission. Today, people say, your mother died two months ago. Aren't you ever it yet? Or like that there's some higher good in just getting on to the happy mm -hmm. um, and bypassing it, as you were saying. That's one of the spiritual principles. It's really making space for it in your life. One of the things that I learned that um, was astounding to me it, I feel that the older I get, the more I realize the power of our own subconscious mind. Because I saw how my subconscious would shelve it when I needed it to be shelved, when I had to work, when I had to give a lecture, when I had to give a seminar. Uh, my subconscious knew I had to function. And then uh, it was unbelievable. So when you do this with God and you do it prayerfully, spirit knows how to navigate through this. And I hope that the book provides people with some of those tools. And then the, sea, the every night is followed by morning. Every winter is followed by spring. And what I know in my life, Kelly, is that because I have looked so deeply at the things that sent me into sad times, not only do I have more compassion for other people, but hopefully I'm a better, wiser person. Hello. <laughs> For yourself, all, right? Compassion for yourself, too. And that's what this is all about. The universe is intentional. It is the mind of God at work. Mm -hmm. And the intention is that we become self-actualized, enlightened beings. And sometimes it's our failures. It's it's the times that we fall. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the times that we grieve. It, it is through the divorce, or it is through the, uh, the financial <clears throat> failure, or it is through the pref professional uh, downturn. Or it is through losing someone that we love that we we become wise, and so, we shouldn't be so so resistant to those times. They will not kill us. What will kill us is if we don't open ourselves up to the winter of life. The avoidance of the pain will kill yeah. us and harm us the most. More and and that. that's what's so great about this book, because it it gives you those tools in there that that helps you dive in and allows you, it just helps me. I feel resonance when I read it. I feel love coming off the pages actually. And I feel seen. And I think that presence, um, with tribe community and for ourselves is just being seen, right. And holding presence and heard and heard, right. Just feeling, feeling understood that we're not less, you know, we're not alone. And that's, you know, the stories that we share at Women for One, that's what it's about. It's about women sharing so that they know they're not alone and they know a lot of other people have been through it. Right. And, and not only women sharing, but also other women listening. Yes. And bearing witness, you know, bearing witness to the agony of others. Gandhi talked about it as soul force. And the, the night before the crucifixion of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, when his disciples wanted to fall asleep, well, on the outer planes, it's because it was late at night. On the inner planes, it's because they knew what was going to happen the next morning. And Jesus said, can you not remain awake with me in the hour of my agony? Mm -hmm. It is important to remain awake with someone in the hour of their agony. You know, we all know the sort of man, classic man, woman, John Gray, men are from Mars, mm -hmm. women are from Venus stuff, that a woman just wants to share her feelings and a man wants to try to fix it. Women understand that just listening, you don't have to fix it. And sometimes things can't be fixed so much. What you don't want to say to somebody is, oh, don't feel that way. Or you don't want to say to somebody, oh, you didn't make a mistake. You can't make a mistake when you know in your heart you made a mistake. Someone just, we need to just hold each other's hearts while we cry. Mm. 
It's beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, and then really the last question before I, I walk into a, a place where I'd love for you to read is around how do you feel right now in society women can move into our power more? You were talking about Iraq before and, you know, other than the, the witness and the empathy, how can we as powerful women in the West um, move forward in our lives and support and uplift the world and humanity right now even more? Women sometimes ask me, how do you find your voice? The way you find your voice is by using your voice on behalf of someone who doesn't have one. The way to find your power is to use it on behalf of others, not just yourself. Um, we keep talking about ourselves as powerful women, but I don't know that <laughs> I, I think self-congratulations are not necessarily in order. I agree. Given the extraordinary power of Western women, um, if we were really powerful women, uh, I, I'm not sure 12,000 children would be starving uh, every day. They're starving to death because the wealthy nations in the world are basically allowing it to happen. Now, global poverty has, the situation has improved over the last few years, but this is relative when you're still talking about thousands of children who, who are dying every day. When you look at some of what's going on in this country, some people are certainly standing up and standing on principle. But I hear too many women describe themselves as powerful these days. <laughs> really? really? Like, tell me what we've done. You know what I'm saying? So, I love that, Marianne. I agree. I'm just saying, how can we move into our power more, you know? Yeah. <laughs> How can we move into it though? You know, owning, owning ourselves more and, and it being the voice for others is what you're saying. Well, I have to tell you something, Kelly. I worry about our particular corner sometimes, higher mm -hmm. consciousness community. We yep. are, are really contributing to this self-centered, entitled, narcissistic tenor of our times. Mm -hmm. um, it, your, your pain is not just your pain. Uh, your pain is actually much less than, than that of some people in the world who, who suffer tremendously more than you do. And I know, you know, I get criticized in some circles, like I'm um, hard on people, but I don't see American women as victims, as oh. poor little dears. Uh, come on, girls, we have to stand up here. Um, and I think it's a decision that you make. I, I think that when you, one of the things that's been very informative in my life, I love reading biographies. And when you read biographies of great people, they weren't people who were not suffering. They weren't people for whom all the stresses and anxieties and challenges had somehow dissolved. They were people who acted anyway, who rose to the occasion of what life was demanding of them. You know, we're a generation, for example, that does more bitching and moaning about what we didn't get when we were children than any other <laughs> generation. And yet we're a generation doing more to neglect and abandon our own children, mm -hmm. the children who are in right in front of us than any generation before. I think we've lost the sense of that life is about doing the right thing, not just doing about whatever you feel like doing at any moment, doing the right thing, being the mother you can be, the friend that you could be, the wife that you could be, the lover that you could be, the daughter that you could be, the sister that you could be, the community member that you could be, the citizen that you could be. You, you can't, you either are, are standing in righteousness, right use of the mind, and being the person that you can be to contribute to the larger matrix of possibility, or you're just thinking about yourself. And if you're just thinking about yourself, first of all, you are going to suffer. You are going to be in pain because you're not an isolated creature. And once you start knowing that the purpose of your life is to stand forth as a light unto others, then that light you cast is on you. And that's what empowers you. The more you make yourself available to life, the more the universe gives you the power to do that which the universe wants you to do. So when you wake up in the morning and say, dear God, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What would you have me say and to whom? God not only sends you instruction, God also sends you the power to carry it off. Mm, that's so beautiful. I, I have nothing to say to that except go. That's amazing. Well, Thank you, you for that. You're doing just great. <laughs> so can we um, open to page 141 yeah. of Tears to Triumph? And I encourage all of my community to read Return to Love as well. I mean, that is, that, it just changed my life, your book, Return to Love. Tears to Triumph is amazing as well. I, I love it. It's just another incredible book, but I really resonated with Return to Love first before I read this. Um, and would you mind reading? Because I love hearing your voice and it's your words. So 
the prayer on page 141. If I may, Kelly, uh, I'd like to also read the paragraph that precedes that. May I? Sure, (laughs) absolutely. Once we embrace the realization that happiness 24-7 is not promised in life, we gain a more mature acceptance of life's ups and downs. Things do not always go as we wish. Not everything is under our control. And no matter what happens, life on Earth is a temporary ride. When we're honest with ourselves, We recognize that every day holds the potential for heartbreak. But joy doesn't rest on trusting that every day will unfold as we wish. Sometimes it rests on simply appreciating the fact that today, on this day, everything is fine. The rough times in our lives can lead us to feeling, among other things, greater gratitude for life when it goes well. Having lost things that were precious, We learn to be much happier with the things that remain. Suffering can leave us scarred, yet still, in almost mysterious ways, we can become better people for having gone through it. Sometimes the fact that I'll never be the same again is not such a bad thing. We won't be who we used to be, but who we become now is completely up to us. Dear God, Please make of my life a beautiful thing. Guide me on an illumined journey from the darkness of the world to the light that is you. Make of me a conduit of good that I might help transform the world. Set my feet upon a hero's journey and my heart on an enlightened path. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Marianne, for your time and your service. I just hold so much love for you and um, gratitude for everything you've done for the world. Kelly, thank you. It's an honor to have been here with you. I think you're great. Uh, Good luck on your book that's going to be coming out. Thank you. Thank you for your endorsement. And I always look forward to whatever steps we take together next. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.